All right. Um, hi, and welcome to my talk, Urbanization and State Development in City Builder Games. So city building and strategy games have been popular since the 1990s. For example, the Civilization series and the Impressions Games series. And in our current decade, they are seeing an incredible boost in a new wave of popularity, particularly in games about ancient Egypt and finally Mesopotamia. Two Mesopotamian city building games, Sumerians and Nebuchadnezzar, were released in 2020 and 2021, respectively. A remake of the classic 1999 Pharaoh is in its last phases of development and may be released next year. An alpha preview of Builders of Egypt was released in 2020, but the game is still in development. Also, another game, Dynasty of the Sands, is in development, but is significantly delayed. There have been other ancient Egyptian strategy and city building games between the 90s and the 2020s, such as Pre-Dynastic Egypt from 2016, Egypt Old Kingdom from 2018, and Children of the Nile from 2008. And at the time of composing this conference paper, I learned of yet another planned uh, of another game planned as an RPG and city builder together um, that's in early development and it's called Akhenaten Rule as Pharaoh. And we just have, a, sorry, I have three cats. One of them's very noisy. So we might be having some more uh, visitors. This one, this is one of them. <laughs> but I'm particularly intrigued to, um, to play this new game uh, as soon as it comes out because Akhenaten's reign is my specialization as an Egyptologist, and so I shall look forward to exploring that through an Archeo gaming lens, and yes, I contacted them. City builders and even survival games like Frostpunk, Dawn of Man, and Planet Base have a very, uh, have a very basic objective. You build a settlement from the ground up and learn new technologies which improve your settlement over time. The games incorporate several forms of challenges such as environment, warfare, funds, and the happiness of both your gods and your citizens. City builders set in antiquity very cleverly aim to incorporate developments that imitate real-world development of ancient societies, such as learning agriculture and how to make pottery. My paper examines the ways in which city-building games depict urbanization in ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia, uh, and how they qualify as tools for teaching this subject in primary and secondary schools and even universities. For this talk, I selected four games to study, two about ancient Egypt and two about Mesopotamia, and there actually are only two games about Mesopotamia anyway. I could have included more, but I am limited to 20 minutes, and also because I wanted to focus on the games I know best, even if I am very bad at them. Um, the four games are Sumerians, Nebuchadnezzar, Classic Pharaoh, and Pre-Dynastic Egypt. The latter is actually classified as a turn-based strategy, but I included it because it does involve development of local city-states and expansion toward coalescing into a united state. Or I think it does, as I always fail miserably and haven't actually seen the proper end. Of these, Pharaoh is the oldest, dating to 1999, and part of a series of similar games developed by Impressions games like Caesar, Zeus, and Emperor. The Mesopotamian games are much more recent and help to fill the hitherto long-term void of games set in Mesopotamia. Nebuchadnezzar follows after the format of Pharaoh, while Sumerians has a much freer game mechanic. In terms of develop settlement development, Sumerians aligns more with pre-dynastic Egypt in terms of its mechanic in the form of multiple linear skill trees rather than a solely administrative mechanic. The skill development in Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar is unlocked automatically and the player has no agency in it. I played the games entirely for research purposes, of course, and I limited my gameplay to early time periods. 
Pre-dynastic Egypt and Sumerians are already set specifically in the early time periods of Egyptian and Mesopotamian civilization when early settlement first developed into an urbanized state. Therefore, in Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar, I limited myself to the missions set in the early dynastic phase of both civilizations. I should also note that Nebuchadnezzar is still being developed even after its official release because the developers are adding more features with each update. For instance, the game currently does not have military features, but they are in development. Therefore, studying this game will have to be considered an ongoing process. Each of the games, except for pre-dynastic, begin with tutorial modes if you play according to their campaign setup chronologically. They also provide the option to jump ahead into other campaigns or missions. The tutorial mode is meant to introduce the many controls and interfaces that the player must navigate to build their city. These can be rather complex, especially in Sumerians at Nebuchadnezzar, where there's a lot going on on the screen. Pharaoh and pre-dynastic are much more condensed. The tutorials are arranged in such a way that they comprise a series of small achievements in cultural development, such as drawing in a population to inhabit uh, newly built houses who can then work, the population who can then work in the agricultural fields to produce grain, thus establishing the most basic te technological developments in early settlement. As your city grows, the tutorials unlock new technologies which acquaint the player with the game's functions. These technological advancements tend to add things such as religious practices, small-scale monuments, new food, pottery, and brewing beer. <laughs> Hello, there we go. Okay. Uh, Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar rely on a very tight-knit city. Oh, actually, no, that's not correct. There we go, that's the one that's correct. Um. Anyway, <laughs> sorry about that. Um. So Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar rely on a very tight-knit city with limited movement arranged on a grid system, where the circle of influence of industries and storage units is quite small, forcing you to build neighborhoods, each with local access to goods and cleverly mapped streets to direct the flow of workers. Nebuchadnezzar, however, introduced a new feature called caravans that allow for the transport of goods from one warehouse to another that is outside an industry's circle of influence. This loosened up the restrictive access, but Sumerians has a style that I refer to as freeform. In this game, the circle of influence can be customized and its largest scale is quite generous, requiring fewer buildings to be constructed. Moreover, it is not arranged on a grid system. Rather, houses and other buildings can be arranged in a more organic, uh, in more organic looking clusters if so wished. It is also unnecessary to build roads in this game to direct citizens where they should go. Footpaths are worn down over time as the citizens mill around freely. And I find this to be much more immersive, and it is a really interesting design. What makes pre-dynastic so challenging is its terminal turn-based system. You have to develop your city and its, ex and its expansion quickly in a limited time and achieve cultural advancements within a prescribed set of time. The game, while successful in its portrayal of pre- and early dynastic Egypt, is very, ob very obviously puts strategy far ahead of customization of the city. I'll discuss its challenges and accuracy further below. The administrative panels consist of massive amounts of details that the player is expected to manage effectively to maintain a prosperous city. These provide excellent lessons in time and resource management, but also illustrate quite well the amount of work that goes into managing a city as a ruler. You are tasked with maintaining balanced workforce, food production, tax, and other income, um, education or other forms of stimulation for your citizens, health and infrastructure, trade and diplomacy, military ventures, and even keeping gods happy because when gods aren't happy, very bad things happen to your city. 
in all the games, I think this is done exceptionally well and highlights how advanced these ancient civilizations were in reality, with stratified society, skilled workers, and complex power systems. What I found to be a rather interesting difference among the games is agency versus non-agency in terms of technological advancement. Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar provide an automated system where progression through the game is automatically, um, sorry, progression through the game automatically unlocks new features that ultimately add complexity to the game over time without the player actively deciding what to develop. This is actually part of the tutorial mode on which the player becomes less reliant with each success, uh, succeeding mission until it is no longer necessary. To some extent, Sumerians and pre-dynastic follow this same model, unlocking game features after accomplishing more basic tasks like acquiring a certain number of population and harvesting your first crops. However, for the uh, for the most part, the game relies upon the player to decide which technologies to learn. Pre-dynastic is limited in this because of the set amount of um, time turns uh, allowed in the game, but there are still a number of choices for the player to make. It requires a strategic plan, whereas Sumerians is, again, quite freeform in this respect. In Sumerians, certain technologies need to be learned before you can, for instance, build a temple or brew beer. And these abilities can only be acquired after building a council of elders, um, who are in essence the learned citizens who convene in a single space. There is no time limit to this game. City building is actually a spectacular format for teaching urbanization with video games. They do reflect quite accurately how societies developed over time and how technologies advanced following discoveries of new resources and skills. In all games, the first requirement is to build houses, uh, which is not only for the purpose of having citizens to do stuff in the games, but also it is exactly what happened with early settlement. Hunter-gatherer societies developed into settled societies after discovering agriculture, and they settled in houses. In Pharaoh, the first mission involves building houses and a hunting lodge, and agriculture is the next development that unlocks. Pre-dynastic follows in this same format, except actual houses are built after a short period of hunting and gathering. Ne Nebuched there we go. Nebuchadnezzar... Um, and Sumerians do not include hunting, and instead they introduce farming wheat and baking bread um, at the start. Also, they include animal husbandry. Sumerians focuses first on using donkeys as working animals, but Nebuchadnezzar introduces goats as a nutritious resource. Both ancient societies first made their buildings entirely with mud brick, with stone being used as a construction material much later. This is reflected quite well in the games, with mud bricks as technological advancements arriving early. Nebuchadnezzar and Sumerians requires only mud or clay, while Pharaoh requires both clay and straw. In these three games, the material is required for monument construction or wall construction and is never used for constructing houses, even though houses would have been made of the same material. In Sumerians, the game distinguishes between simple mud monuments and mud brick monuments, where brick must be manually unlocked by the player as a scientific advancement. In Sumerians, bricks are actually a prestigious resource, and temples and walls built of this material increases um, the nearby houses um, increases the value of nearby houses to allow a wealthier class of people to live there and create stratification in the city. Both Sumerians and Nebuchadnezzar introduce irrigation systems immediately, which is actually quite true to reality in ancient Mesopotamia because the Tigris and Euphrates did not function the same way as the Nile River in Egypt. Irrigation canals and shadufs were especially important to their agriculture. 
In Faro, irrigation is discovered several missions into the game, but it mainly and accurately relies on the annual inundation, which was actually the primary irrigation method in ancient Egypt. The inundation in Egypt also allowed for farmers to be conscripted for large-scale monument construction during the season when the fields were flooded, whereas in Mesopotamia this was less easily accomplished. The two main diet staples in both ancient societies were bread and beer. Nebuchadnezzar does not introduce brewing beer in the early stages of the game, but in Pharaoh, beer is introduced quite early. And in Sumerians, it is the second skill in one of the three skill trees in the industries category. Predynastic introduces beer in the later portions of the industry skill tree, which would make sense for this game since it is set entirely in the pre- and early dynastic periods. Pottery was also one of the most essential technological advancements, and even in archaeology today, it is the most important evidence we have for dating archaeological layers. Along with the discovery of clay, potters are introduced in the games quite early. Pottery was used for storage and beer and grain could not have been kept very long, or at all, where beer is concerned, without a container to keep it in. In Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar, it is a prestigious item where it can be traded and also levels up houses. Probably in every household in real antiquity there would have been pottery, and it was likely not actually a, as prestigious as the games make it out to be, mm. because access to them would not have been too restrictive. They are easy to make, and the crafting resources were abundant. However, it is true that the discovery of pottery craftsmanship was transformative for these ancient societies. Sumerians does something quite unique and includes a skill tree involving writing, maths, and contracts. Mesopotamia was the first of the two civilizations I'm examining here to invent writing, and they were in fact leaps and bounds ahead of ancient Egypt in terms of writing by the time it was developed in Egypt perhaps by about 1,000 years. It was absolutely an important early technology in Mesopotamia, and its inclusion in Sumerians is quite brilliant. The other games include forms of education, but not with the same detail and care that is presented in Sumerians. Religion is another important feature in the games. In Nebuchadnezzar and Pharaoh, attention to the gods is crucial, and if they don't receive temples and festivals, um, they, sorry, where was I? Okay. <laughs> um, if they don't receive temples and festivals, they can actually do a lot of harm to your city, such as bringing pestilence, destroy storage yards filled with goods, negatively affect harvests, and other problems. However, they could also offer boons when they are satisfactorily appeased. In pre-dynastic, the gods only have a positive function and do not actually cause any damage, even in the case where you fail to be the first to build a very important first temple to Horus. In Sumerians, temples provide prestige to the city, but there is not any significant ev emphasis on worship, which is certainly in contrast to real Mesopotamian cities. Lastly, warfare and diplomacy do feature in the games, but in different levels of intensity. Sumerians is pretty insular in this regard, and Pharaoh introduces peaceful trade much sooner than warfare. Nebuchadnezzar has an interesting method of introducing trade, uh, where your city needs to be prestigious enough for other cities to deign to trade with you. But there is no military mechanic yet. Pre-dynastic is much more aggressive in its inclusion of warfare, and it is introduced almost immediately. One of the game's objectives is to build a unify unified state, which can only be achieved through peaceful alliances or combat. So, some game challenges. In Sumerians, there aren't a lot of stakes in this game. It seems to be geared toward a player that just wants to leisurely build a city during their morning coffee. It is easy. Its easy mode erases challenges altogether, and if you go into debt, 
um, which I always do in games, <laughs> you are often, um, you are given unlimited credit. However, you have the option also to add challenges to not only make the game require significant thought and planning, but also to make it more true to reality. Nebuchadnezzar also does not really have a situation where you are uh, doomed, probably because there's not a, a military mechanic just yet. The challenges are in maintaining enough resources through agriculture and manufacturing and being able to build your finances through trade of goods. There are infrastructure and health challenges, but these are easily mitigated through construction of firehouses, city guards, and physicians. Pharaoh and pre-dynastic include greater challenges, namely Pharaoh has a rather aggressive system where the player must send gifts to other cities or the king himself. If this is not done in a timely manner several times, the pharaoh's army will come to destroy your city and there is no recovery from this. Administration can actually be quite stressful when people leave your city and resource production goes down, leading to more depopulation, depopulation leading to angry gods who destroy things and so on. It's a pretty horrifying cycle of despair. Um, Pre-dynastic is the most challenging due to its turn-based mechanic where you need to strategize quickly in order to meet the requirements for achieving specific goals. Only if you fail uh, does the game offer advice on how not to fail. This might be annoying if not for the fact you can replay the game in its entirety in just a few hours. You can simply apply the tips to your next gameplay but that doesn't necessarily mean it's any easier. So some educational merit. For the first time learners of uh, urbanization and state development and who wish to learn at a slow pace, I would recommend Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar. Um, they have their challenges, but their more linear format makes for a more easygoing gameplay. Pre-dynastic is great for learning details about pre- and early dynastic Egypt, but it is certainly not for the faint of heart. It puts heavy emphasis on the strategy aspect and fast-paced accomplishments, but it still has its merits in that you can play it in a few hours and try again. It might serve as some kind of championship game in a classroom. Sumerians throws a lot at you at once if you don't run through the tutorials, and it's not exactly intuitive, so it can be quite challenging in that respect, but unlike the others, it is much freer. There is no time limit, and there is no leveling up, where you need to constantly rebuild a new city in each new mission or campaign. You can open a customized terrain and build your city and unlock all the developments within the same game and same within the same place and same saved game. As already mentioned, on easy mode, you can receive unlimited credit in funds. So there's a possibility to have no real threats to the city and no large scale irreversible destruction. It can function only as an exercise of building a well-functioning city with proper resources needed, needed for early development and city-states. It could actually function as a long-term school project. Also, I should mention that I and my colleague Kate Minetti consulted on an Archeo Gaming teaching module with Save Ancient Studies Alliance, which provides a lot of teaching materials on urbanization in ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia. The teacher's pack includes an amazing video that incorporates footage from the games I examined in this talk, as well as a couple others, and it is available for free for educators to use, use in their curriculum. So I recommend there's other um, modules as well, not just uh, urbanization, but go for it. Um, and also, thank you so much for listening to my talk. And I've put a QR code on here for you in case you want to visit my website, my YouTube channel, and see other things that I have um, done. So thank you. Bye.